Do you enjoy sail-proof car reviews? If so, please be sure to click my picture in the corner right over here to subscribe and click the bell notification for a friendly reminder every single week. Hello and welcome to another episode. My name is Tamir and my YouTube channel is all about car salesmen, car dealerships, the car sales process, and sale-proof cars. Behind me is a 1985 Peugeot 505 station wagon, and I am absolutely ecstatic that a viewer here in Des Moines, Washington let me film the car. And I'm ecstatic for two big reasons. One, because I didn't actually have to travel very far to find this car, and two, I've been looking for months to actually talk about this car because this car is a classic case of an excellent vehicle that was really poorly marketed. So today, I thought I'd give you a brief history of Peugeot and their sales here in the United States, and then we're gonna go on a walk around of one of their more prominently sold vehicles in the United States, the 505, and then we're gonna ask ourselves, if this car was for sale today at a dealership, would it be desirable or would it be sale-proof? Peugeot, despite its obscurity in the United States, is actually one of the oldest, most interesting, and actually most varied car companies in the world. Here's a brief history about them. Peugeot has family business roots dating back all the way to 1810, which goes as far back as Napoleon's rule, and the company built coffee mills, saw blades, and bicycles, not necessarily in that order. Throughout the 1800s, the Peugeot company got involved in various manufacturing businesses, and it wasn't until 1889 when family member Armand Peugeot built four examples of a three-wheeled steam-powered automobile, or effectively a tricycle, and that was the beginning of Peugeot's pursuit into automotive development. A year later, Peugeot developed a more sophisticated four-wheeled vehicle instead of a three-wheeled vehicle that had a petrol engine that was built by Panard, which is a French manufacturer that later became Citroën that we know and love, and they built this new car under a Daimler license. Sound like any car that we recently did a sale-proof car review of? This car featured a three-point suspension, a sliding gear transmission, and supposedly Peugeot was the first auto manufacturer to actually fit rubber tires to its automobiles. Armand, who was the black sheep of the Peugeot family, went on to build 141 of these vehicles up until 1896, when he formed the Société des Automobiles Peugeot, which was his way of breaking free of the Peugeot family business so that way he could focus on cars and motorcycles. But we won't get into too many details of that in this particular video. So now that Peugeot has been established as an automotive player in the automotive landscape, let's fast forward all the way to 1958 when Peugeot was first brought to the United States. Peugeot North America first imported the 403 model, which never really took off, and then four years later, the 404 successor came out, which also never really took off. In 1970, the successor to the 404 model, the 504, was introduced stateside, and Peugeot even brought a second smaller model, the 304 stateside, in hopes of increasing sales in the United States. But despite this, sales didn't really increase significantly enough for Peugeot to bring more models to the United States, and two years later, the 304 was killed off stateside. In 1980, Peugeot introduced the successor to the 504 model, the forward-thinking and very advanced 505 model, which is the same model that I reviewed for today's video, and it actually sold the best out of any model that was sold in the United States from Peugeot. Throughout its model run, it was available in both a sedan and a wagon form, and it was available with a four-cylinder petrol engine, a four-cylinder turbo diesel engine, and a six-cylinder engine. The vehicle that I reviewed in today's video was a wagon with the turbo diesel powertrain. Now, while the 505 model did sell extremely well around the world, in the United States, relatively speaking, it sold well compared to other Peugeot models, but it only peaked at 20,000 units in 1984. And ultimately, in 1991, Peugeot pulled the plug on United States sales. Today, Peugeot is sold around the world, and it's actually a really competitive and really strong-selling brand, so we have to ask ourselves, what happened in the United States that caused it to go wrong? And will it ever return to the United States? And the answer to why Peugeot didn't really succeed in the United States is twofold. The first is unfamiliarity with the brand, and the second reason is rapid over-expansion. 
See, Peugeot was first introduced to the United States during a time when many different foreign car brands were first coming to the United States, and so people had a lot of different options available to them, and because they didn't have the same history as some of the domestic brands, that alone gave them a disadvantage as far as familiarity goes for the United States market. And then as far as rapid overexpansion, which is the real reason that killed off Peugeot, the reason I mention that is because when Peugeot first came to the United States, the requirements to open a Peugeot franchise were actually much more lax than most of the other manufacturers that were available. See, many new dealership principals who wanted in on the car boom of the 1950s opted for a Peugeot franchise over another franchise because it cost a lot less money and you needed a lot less experience to actually open one of those stores. So as a result, Peugeot stores started popping up everywhere and all these Peugeot franchises started competing very, very heavily for customers, for inventory, and most importantly, for parts if something broke down. See, what happens typically is when a customer buys a car, occasionally it'll break down, they'll take it back to a dealership and the dealership will order an OEM part that needs to be replaced on the vehicle. However, in Peugeot's case, because there was a part shortage, what would happen is whenever the cars broke down, the cars would sometimes sit in service departments for days and even weeks to correct a problem that with other manufacturers would take only a couple of hours or a couple of days tops. So Peugeot ended up developing a reputation for being notoriously unreliable because cars were sitting in service departments for so long when the reality is they simply couldn't get the parts to fix the cars. And that's despite the fact that Peugeot was actually a really high quality vehicle for that time and there's still a lot of 505s on the road even to this day. So Peugeot hasn't sold in the United States for 28 years, so people speculate are they ever going to return and are they going to correct the mistakes that they made previously? There's a lot of speculation with Peugeot returning to the United States as soon as 2020, but nothing has been confirmed by the Peugeot company yet. So, that being said, let's take a look around the last and probably best vehicle that Peugeot ever sold in the United States, the Peugeot 505. First on our walk around of the Peugeot, I wanted to talk about one of the more defining features of the car, and that would actually be the emblem. The emblem that's prominently placed in the front grille is a lion, actually. And this isn't the original logo. Peugeot has history that dates back to 1810, and they first started manufacturing bicycles and saw blades, and their emblem was actually a lion walking with an arrow, and this was indicative of the speed, the durability, and flexibility of their saw blades. Over time, they eventually got into the automobile business, Business, and they did away with the arrow, so they just did the lion. Either way, it's a really distinctive badge and it's still their badging on their cars that are sold around the world. And while we're still at the front of the Peugeot, one of the other defining features is the headlights. Now, the grille itself is already pretty prominent with the Lion and with that single frame design, but the headlights is something that's always been really distinctive on the car as well. They kind of flare out a little bit, kind of like bell bottoms, even though the 80s was past the disco era. But either way, it really defines the Peugeot well. Now for those die-hard Peugeot fans that want to get technical on me, they're squirming in their pants and they're saying, oh my god, those headlights are the Eurospec version, so that's a Eurospec car. Well, actually, it's a US spec car that was originally sold here in the US back in 1985, but the headlights, the owner actually changed out for the Eurospec lights because, aesthetically, they simply look a little bit better which is crucial in a car that is as good looking as the car behind me right here. Next on our walk around of the Peugeot 505, we have to talk about one of my favorite aesthetic features, which is actually the door handles. If you take a look at the door handles around the car, they are extraordinarily reminiscent of the buckles in airplane seat belts. If you see what I mean, it's chrome plated and it's sideways facing as opposed to just being a handle that you grab onto, kind of like most 80s and 90s vehicles. And it's got a nice weighty feel to it. And they're made out of real metal too. Next on our walk around of the Peugeot 505, I would like to talk about the trunk space. And there is a ton of trunk space in this vehicle. Let me elaborate a little bit further. There were actually some configurations from the factory that you could seat eight people in the station wagon. That's right, in a 1980 station wagon, you could seat up to eight people. Now, unfortunately, this particular vehicle does not actually have the third row seat in it, but considering I was even able to find a station wagon just to show you how spacious it is back here, is pretty amazing. What I can show you, however, is you can actually fold down the second seat, and there is enough space back here, you could probably fit a twin-size mattress, so if you really wanted to live in the back of your Peugeot, you probably could. 
Next, we're gonna head deeper inside of the Peugeot 505, and we're gonna move from the trunk area to the back seats, actually. So I put the back seats back up, and they're incredibly comfortable, but the one oddity that I wanted to point out is actually the placement of the window switches. And instead of being located on the side armrests, they're actually located in the center right here. So you see these two window switches that open and close the windows, and normally in European cars of the time, that's where you'd see the window switches all together, but there's actually a bit of separation and it's a very unique placement particularly for the window switches for the rear of the seats so I thought it was a bit odd and pretty interesting and film worthy. Now we're going to head to the front seat on the inside of the Peugeot 505 and there's quite a few oddities up here and the first one that I wanted to go over is actually the horn or more specifically the placement of the horn. Now on most vehicles you have the horn in the center of the steering wheel or there's going to be a button that you can push right there. On this car it's actually a stock button that you push in so the stock to the left is normally your turn signal but at the end of that turn signal is actually the horn that you can push in. Take a look and see what I mean. Next on the inside of the Peugeot, I wanted to talk about the little courtesy light that's right next to the ignition switch. So the ignition switch is in the same place where it normally is on the vehicle. It's on the steering stock and then you can put a key in there and turn on the car. However, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to see. So they actually put this little courtesy light in a little amber lamp right next to it. So it stays on so that way you can see where it is if it's dark out and you're trying to turn on your Peugeot. Next on our walk around of the Peugeot, we have to talk about the gauge cluster, and the gauge cluster is actually surprisingly well laid out, but there's a couple of oddities in there. The first oddity I wanted to point out is actually at the bottom of the speedometer. If you take a look at the bottom of the speedometer, you notice it says Jaeger PJ83, and Jaeger was actually the name of the manufacturer of the gauges. So if you're watching this in 2019, it brings a whole new meaning to the word Jaeger. Next in the gauge cluster, we also have on the left side our oil level. Normally you would have your oil temperature as a gauge, but it's actually pretty unusual to see your oil level. So if your oil starts to burn off in the Peugeot, which let's face it, it doesn't happen that much, you'll at least know. And finally, also within the gauge cluster, we have to talk about the warning lights. Now, there's two sets of warning lights, one all the way on the left and one all the way on the right. The one that's all the way on the left is more informative and they're typically gonna be a green color when they're lit up. If you look on the right side, all of them are gonna be lit up red. So if your oil temperature gets too hot, red. If your oil pressure is too low, red. If your brakes aren't working, red. If your battery isn't working, red. It's a Christmas party in France. Light up the Christmas tree! Next on our inside walk around of the Peugeot, we have to talk about the climate controls in the center stack. And they're pretty well labeled, but I have to say they're pretty darn confusing because there's four separate adjustments. That's right, four adjustments for your climate controls instead of one single dial. The first control on the climate control stack is going to be your fan speed. There's one through four, that's pretty self-explanatory. But the second one, you see a snowflake, and then you see two snowflakes, which I assume is adjusting the amount of refrigerant that's being used in your air conditioning or air condenser unit. So it's not 100% straightforward, and unfortunately I can't find anything on the internet that tells me what it is, but maybe one of you can let me know what it is. Then we have the third stack, which has a little blue and a little red indicator, which is indicative of the heat. That's also pretty self-explanatory. Then you have the fourth one, which is your mode or your area of ventilation. However, it has the defroster, it has the face, it has the feet areas. And then you have the two snowflakes and the one snowflake, which again, I'm still not 100% sure what it means. So again, if somebody does know what that means, because I can't find anything on the internet, please let everybody know what they're indicative of. It's a Christmas party in France. And the last oddity that I wanted to talk about on the interior of the Peugeot 505 is the dome light. You can take a look right by the rear view mirror and there's this dome light and it has these two blank switches that appear as though there would be buttons there to turn on a light. Unfortunately, there are blanks in this vehicle. However, the dome light itself, it pivots. So you can pivot it over to the left and then it turns on and it points towards the driver. Then you can put it in the center and then it turns it off and then you can point it over towards the passenger and it lights up again. So it's actually a pretty unique design, although it does have a couple of drawbacks because let's say both the driver and the passenger actually want the light on. You can't have the light shining on both of them at the same time. And then the other design flaw is why do they have the blanks? I mean, they might as well just have put lights in there to begin with. 
So there you have it. That is a complete walk around of the Peugeot 505 turbo diesel station wagon. It's surprisingly a really durable car, which is why you still see a few of them on the road, even though they didn't sell in great numbers. However, we have to ask ourselves, it was sale proof back then. Is it still sale proof now? So due to the remote location of the Peugeot that I filmed, unfortunately I wasn't able to find 10 passerbys to determine whether the car is desirable or if it's sale proof. So I thought I'd score it with the old scoring system. So first we're gonna judge the Peugeot on awareness. It earns a three out of 10. Next we're gonna judge the Peugeot on its appearance. It earns a four out of 10. Next we're gonna judge the Peugeot 505 on its amenities. It earns a four out of 10. Next, we're gonna judge the Peugeot 505 on its availability. It earns a two out of 10. Finally, we're gonna judge the Peugeot 505 on its affordability. It earns a 10 out of 10. So we add all of that up and the total score is 23 out of 50, making the Peugeot one of the most sale-proof cars that I've reviewed. It's not the most sale-proof car because its saving grace is it's still relatively inexpensive, but let's face it, Many young people don't know what Peugeot is in the United States, and many people even my age don't even remember what the car is because it's fallen to obscurity. That and the fact that there's not very many of them available for sale just makes it generally a pretty obscure car that people simply aren't aware exists, so it just doesn't compete with other cars that I've reviewed that have a cult following. However, that said, what say you? Do you think the Peugeot 505 is a desirable car, or do you think it's sale-proof in the United States? Please feel free to leave a comment below in my comment section to discuss the Peugeot 505 further. Do you enjoy sale-proof car reviews? If so, please be sure to click my picture in the corner right over here to subscribe and click the bell notification for a friendly reminder every single week. Now we're gonna head to the front seat inside the Peugeot 505 and there's some oddities up here that I wanted to talk about. And the first oddity that I wanted to talk about was actually I forget. <laughs>